All right, so <clears throat> lipids is the fourth big group of macromolecules. You'll recall we first talked about proteins, then nucleic acids. The last movie was on carbohydrates, and so this is the fourth group of macromolecules that are the building block of cells, lipids. Now, unlike <clears throat> proteins, unlike nucleic acids, unlike polysaccharides, lipids are not polymers, they're not chains. The feature that unites all lipids is that they're primarily hydrophobic. So we would, we would predict they're, they're going to be rich in carbon, carbon nonpolar covalent bond, and carbon hydrogen nonpolar covalent bonds. <clears throat> they have a wide range of functions. They can act as energy storage. As we said, they're really important in the structure of cell membranes. They can act as messenger molecules, and we'll also see that in our acid fast bacteria, they're important components of the bacteria cell wall. So the, the four groups of lipids we'll be discussing are the fats, also known as triacylglycerols or triglycerides, the phospholipids, steroids, and then last, the waxes. So um, if we're talking about fats, um, some folks refer to fats as simple, li simple lipids. Um, and again, synonyms are triglyceride or triacylglycerols. Once again, we want to look at structure. So if we were to synthesize a, um, a triacylglycerol, triglyceride, or fat, we're going to start with the three carbon glycerol. So here's our three carbon, what I'll call our glycerol backbone. And then we're going to add three fatty acids. So one, two, three. And the way we're going to add <coughs> excuse me, the way we're going to covalently link the fatty acids to our glycerol here is through dehydration synthesis. So you can see we're going to remove the elements um, of three molecules of water, one, two, three, and the result will be formation of a, the result will be the formation of a new covalent bond called an ester bond. So ester bonds are what link our fatty acid residues to our glycerol residue. Now, the type of fatty acid that we use when we make our fat will influence the physical properties of the fat. So let's take a look at some of the different uh, types of fatty acids that we have. So the reason fatty acids are called fatty acids, let's look at that acid. So fatty acids have this carboxyl group, and you'll remember carboxyl groups, they can undergo reversible ionization, releasing um, hydrogen ions, protons causing an increase in hydrogen ion concentration and a drop in pH. So this carboxyl group then is the acid, the acidic portion of the fatty acid. And then fat, we think of hydrocarbons, nonpolar hydrocarbons. So the fat, like the fat hydrophobic portion here is this part, this little tail of the fatty acid. And you can see it consists of a carbon chain. And then we have hydrogens linked to the, each of the carbons. And even though it's zigzaggy here, this is a relatively straight chain. And the reason is, is that the carbons are all what we call saturated. The carbons are, are bound to um, the maximum number of hydrogens here. And so as a result, we're going to end up with this long straight chain. So if we make fats and we use saturated fatty acids, for example, like right up there, and if we use three saturated fatty acids, the fat molecules themselves could be tightly packed together because of these nice long straight tails and as a result of hydrophobic interactions attractive forces usually at room temperature fats made with saturated fatty acids are often solids so you might think of animal fat like like butter or like the fat around my middle it's solid at um, room temperature or even higher at body temperature now in contrast if we take a look at a different type of fatty acid, this is called an unsaturated fatty acid. I think of the carbons aren't saturated with hydrogens. So again, let's take a look here. So here's our carboxyl group, the acid. But take a look at this cool hydrocarbon tail. So we, it's relatively straight until we get there. And take a look at that carbon-carbon double bond. So you see here, this carbon-carbon double bond, it makes a big kink, a big bend in the fatty acid tail. So if we use unsaturated fatty acids when we're making our fats, the um, fats can't pack tightly together 
and as a consequence, usually fats made with unsaturated fatty acids tend to be liquid at room temperature. So I always think of, of plant fats, plant oils, as being liquid at room temperature. Okay, so there. And then um, I think in a, another slide we'll talk about how in nature, when um, plants, for example, make unsaturated fat, fatty acids, they usually have the orientation of hydrogens across this carbon-carbon double bond is usually in what we call the cis configuration. And it's only when us humans get involved and start kind of monkeying around with these uh, uh, fatty acids that we get the unnatural transform. And then we'll, we'll talk about some of the consequences. Okay, so a uh, a uh, lecture exam question might be, what are the components of a fat? So you'd want to tell me a glycerol molecule and three fatty acids. Um, and the new bond that's formed when we link our fatty acids to the glycerol backbone is an ester bond. An ester bond is a covalent bond between um, an alcohol, which would be, our, would be our glycerol, and an acid. So just an example then, um, this is nice, it's showing that new ester bond that's formed through dehydration synthesis. So here we have, this would be a saturated, saturated fatty acid residue. Here's another saturate, saturated fatty acid residue. And here's our monounsaturated fatty acid residue, a single carbon-carbon double bond. And again, note how it makes that bend there. And this is also really cool, you guys, because this is showing the normal cis arrangement of the hydrogens. So when we're looking at whether we have cis or trans, we look at that carbon-carbon double bond and we ask ourselves, are the two hydrogens on the same plane relative to the carbon-carbon double bond or, or are they opposite one another? So again, this is, this is how unsaturated fatty acids are made in nature, for example, by plants. But it's when humans get in there and start to chemically monkey around with these fatty acids that we can end up with the unnatural, what's called trans. So in the trans um, fatty acids or trans fats, one of the hydrogens would be here, but this other hydrogen would be on the opposite side of that carbon-carbon double bond. And the trans fats, we now know, can have really bad health effects. They can increase our risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, it's possible um, perhaps some of them increase our risk for cancers. So I'm so glad there's been an effort to get rid of trans fats out of our processed foods because they, they truly are not good for us. Um, do note here that the fatty acids can vary in the number of carbons. Um, we've already talked about they can be saturated or unsaturated. And in the unsaturated fatty acids, you could have more than one carbon-carbon double bond, and then we would have polyunsaturated fatty acids. So the, um, these fats, again, they're wonderful um, stores for energy. In mammals like ourselves, they're great insulators, can be shock absorbers. <laughs> when I fall down, my fats act as a shock absorber. Okay. And again, folks, this is just is so often I talk about the topic and then I show you this the slide. So in the saturated fat, remember in the fatty acid tail there's no um, double double bonds, so nice straight tail so they can pack tightly together, usually solids at room temperature. Unsaturated fats, um, we're going to have at least one unsaturated fatty acid tail um, with that bend. This is the normal cis arrangement here. The hydrogen atoms are on the same side of the carbon-carbon double bond. Trans, again, this is, um, this is not natural. This is a result of, of taking unsaturated fatty acids and hydrogenating them. Um, back in the 50s when I was born, um, people would take vegetable oils, which were liquid at room temperature, and then humans would hydrogenate them, trying to uh, trying to convert them to an unsaturated fatty acid so that they would be solid at room temperature. And the classic one was margarine. And I remember in the 50s and 60s, um, it was believed that margarine was healthier for you than um, butter made from cow's milk. And it, so my mom was very health conscious, so we were raised on margarine. And unfortunately, it turns out margarine is not healthier for you because of this trans configuration. Um, and I've had former micro students tell me from their nutrition class, which I hope you all can take a nutrition class, probably one of the most important classes you could ever take, that in this trans configuration, instead of the tail, the fatty acid tails being bent, 
now they're, they're, they're straighter, just like we saw in um, our unsaturated fatty acids. And, and furthermore, my understanding is because the trans fats are unnatural, we can't break them down. And again, you guys, don't, I, I'm not an expert at this, but accumulation then perhaps of these um, trans fats in our um, vascular system, our heart, that could be an increased risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Okay, and then this um, Dr. Diane Bennett, who I admire so much, um, she listened to my microbiochemistry lectures, and I, I often use olive oil as an example of a monounsaturated fatty um, fat, um, olive oil. And I've tried to, instead of using margarine now, I try to use more olive oil. And she said that she had read that in heating olive oil to high temperatures, unfortunately, that good normal cis configuration in the fatty acid tail can be switched to trans. So I hope that's not correct. <laughs> but I guess the healthiest way then um, to consume olive oil is try not to try not to heat it to high temperatures to keep that good cis configuration here. So next we're going to move from our fats, our triacylglycerol, triglycerides to phospholipids, and this is a big deal, you guys, because we're going to see phospholipids are really important component of cell membranes, cytoplasmic membranes, um, plasma membranes, and we will also see them in one type of bacterial cell wall, the gram-negative bacterial cell wall. So what I like to do is I, I like to think, well, let me start with a, with a simple fat, okay? And so again, you guys, just to get you oriented, here's the glycerol backbone, the three carbons, and as we would have in a, um, in a fat, a triacylglycerol, here we have um, the fatty acid residue. So here's a saturated fatty acid, here's an unsaturated fatty acid residue with a bend there. But what makes a phospholipid different from a fat triacylglycerol triglyceride is we're gonna, we're gonna substitute the third fatty acid. We're not gonna use a third fatty acid. Instead, we're going to attach a phosphate group to that third carbon. And then usually there's an additional organic, a chemical group attached to the phosphate. Now this means phospholipids have this really cool structure. These long hydrocarbon tails, we want to remember these are all nonpolar covalent bonds. So these long hydrocarbon tails are going to be nonpolar and hydrophobic, okay, nonpolar and hydrophobic. But when we get up here and we start throwing in some oxygens and we know this phosphate group is going to ionize, and very often the additional organic group is either ionized or polar, this, cr this creates another distinct portion of the phospholipid that's going to be polar, lots of polar covalent bonds, if not outright ionized. And we know that water adores um, molecules rich in polar covalent bonds. Water adores um, ionized um, substances. So this portion then of our phospholipid is going to be really hydrophilic. And we have a fancy term for molecules that have a distinct hydrophilic region and a distinct hydrophobic region. We call them amphipathic or amphiphilic. And because if we're trying to draw cartoons of phospholipids, it's really hard to draw this whole structure. What we do is we adopt a cartoon of a phospholipid. We use a circle to represent the hydrophilic head, water-loving head. And then we just draw two little squiggly lines to represent the nonpolar hydrophobic tails. Now again, this great structure means that in water-rich environments like a cell, these phospholipids will spontaneously take on brand new forms. So they have these incredible emergent properties. So let's see if we can see what some of those new structures are. So again, the, um, our convention is we use a head for the hydrophilic head, and these little squiggles are the hydrophobic tails, okay? And we're going to see how these phospholipids in water will sp spontaneously form micelles, liposomes, and phospholipid bilayers. So this is an example of what's called a micelle. And just to get you oriented here, you guys, the blue is going to be the hydrophilic head, and the, these little yellow tails, those are the the hydrophobic tails. So hydrophilic head, hydrophobic tails. And if we take a bunch of these phospholipids and we mix them in water, what will happen is the heads are going to orient 
to the outside of these little cool what we call micelles. So see how the heads are pointing outward where they can interact with water, have attract, attractive forces with water, and then the hydrophobic tails get pushed into the center. So this is a, a distinct nonpolar hydrophobic region. And then on the outside of the micelle, this is the hydrophilic region where we'll have water interacting with the hydrophilic heads. Now, if we perhaps alter how much phospholipids present, maybe alter the agitation, we can get a second cool structure form. These are the phospholipid bilayers. And those of you that have had ANP, this is starting to look suspiciously like a cell membrane. So in a phospholipid bilayer, we have two layers of phospholipids. So here's one layer, and here's the second layer. So bilayer, two layers. And again, we notice that the hydrophilic heads are oriented outwards where they can interact with water. So here and here. So this would be a hydrophilic surface. This would be a hydrophilic surface. And all the nonpolar hydrophobic tails are pushed to the interior. So this is a great nonpolar hydrophobic area right here. Now, if we, we had a um, big, big, big phospholipid bilayer, we would see that this hydrophobic area acts as a barrier. Hydrophilic substances on this side of the phospholipid bilayer can't cross, oops, can't cross through that hydrophobic barrier. And the reason is that a hydrophilic substance will be attracted to the hydrophilic heads into water. There's no attractive force in here. There's no, no pull to move the hydrophilic molecules from this side of the bilayer to that side. And thus, we say that these phospholipid bilayers, we can say they're selectively or semi-permeable. They won't permit passage of large hydrophilic molecules. So why do we care? Well, that's a really important property of cell membranes. Probably the most important job of cell membranes is to be semi or selectively permeable, to control what's going to move across the cell membrane. Now this is always a little bit hard to do with a PowerPoint. I like to use a model in lecture, so hopefully I can show you that in lecture. If you can imagine, maybe a sheet of paper as being your great big phospholipid bilayer, and if you curl the pa paper around so that the ends meet, um, you'll see that you, you would potentially have two water-rich compartments, an internal interior water-rich compartment, and then the external water-rich compartment. Um, that's, a, that's a crude model for what are called liposomes. So liposomes are really cool. They have an interior water-rich compartment, and then we have this water-rich compartment outside. And now we're really starting to look at what might be a primitive cell, a protocell. Because again, we have an interior water-rich compartment, which could eventually evolve into the cytoplasm of a cell. We have our semi-permeable, selectively permeable um, phospholipid bilayer, and then this water-rich compartment outside of the cell. So the reason we're interested in uh, liposomes is, again, they might be a great model for how the er first early protocells, pre-cells evolved. And furthermore, what's really, really cool is that it's been discovered you can package toxic chemicals, toxic, toxic medications inside liposomes. And then you can infuse your patient with these liposomes containing the toxic drug, and the liposomes will slowly break down, slowly releasing the drug so you won't overwhelm your patient's kidneys or livers. Um, an example, really important example, is when we start talking about fungi, we're going to start talking about antifungal drugs, and the oldest one, probably most famous, is called amphotericin B. The problem with amphotericin B is that it can damage your patient's kidneys and liver. Um, we're going to discover amphotericin B, sometimes it's the last drug of choice to treat the fungal mycoses. Mycoses are fungal infections. The fungal mycoses called San Joaquin Valley fever, and that's a really important one for us to know here in California. San Joaquin Valley fever, or coccidioidomycosis, is caused by the fungal pathogen coccidioides imidis. We inhale um, the spores, and the spores germinate in our lungs and can cause damage to the lungs. And unfortunately, the fungus can spread throughout the body to skin, to bone, and to brain. So it's often really hard to treat. So 
sometimes the only drug that the physicians feel will, will potentially, hopefully, kill the coccidioides is amphotericin B. But again, um, giving the patients amphotericin B can be really toxic for them. So in making these liposomal preps, they incorporate the amphotericin B in the liposome, infuse the patient with the liposomes, and slowly, slowly, the liposomes break down, slowly releasing the amphotericin B. So the patient's kidneys and liver won't receive so much damage. So that's really cool. This is a, a cartoon, and again, those of you that have had A and B, this is probably looking really familiar. Um, so our model of cell membranes, plasma membranes, cytoplasmic membranes, is the fluid mosaic model. And an important component of the fluid mosaic model of cell membranes are these beautiful phospholipid bilayers. So here we have our phospholipid bilayer, hydrophilic heads here, hydrophilic heads there, hydrophobic tails there. So the phospholipids are the fluid portion. They can move to and fro, as so, like fluid, like consistency of olive oil. Imagine the phospholipids is a, like a, um, a bilayer of olive oil, and the fluid, the fluid um, um, characteristic is really important. And then fluid mosaic, I think of these proteins that, that are floating in this ocean of phospholipids, those are like little mosaic tiles. And so in the classic model, the fluid mosaic model of cell membranes, again, we have a phospholipid bilayer and cell um, membrane proteins. And we're going to see one really important job of these membrane proteins is to act as transport proteins. They will permit large hydrophilic molecules to cross from one side of the me membrane to the other. Okay, so in the next unit, unit three, we'll have some diagrams. And just be aware, you guys, on usually lecture, um, lecture one, usually I have a diagram of a cell membrane and I have you identify, you know, where are the phospholipids, where are the membrane proteins, where are the hydrophilic heads, where are the hydrophobic tails here. Okay, and again, the reason the, the phospholipid bilayers are so crucial is they're going to act as our semi or selective permeable barrier preventing hydrophilic mo molecules from crossing and therefore the hydrophilic molecules have to be transported by a proteins and that's how the cell can select which hydrophilic molecules will cross is with these um, uh, membrane transport proteins. The third group of lipids are the steroids and you can see here this is totally different from our fats from our phospholipids. We don't see glycerol, we don't see any fatty acids. Instead what we have, all the steroids have these four carbon rings here, A, B, C, and D. And if I was truly talking about a steroid, I wouldn't have this hydroxyl group here. So a steroid all by itself is just these um, hydrocarbon rings and then additional hyd hydrocarbons here. So again, we want to remember a molecule that's made of hydrocarbons, it's going to be nonpolar and thus hydrophobic. What cells will do is add functional groups. So here we have a hydroxyl group that um, converts our steroid to a sterol, S-T-E-R-O-L, an alcohol. And indeed, this is the sterol that we humans make. This is cholesterol. And we know, well, cholesterol gets lots of bad press, but cholesterol is really crucial to maintain the fluidity of our cell membrane. So cholesterol plays a really important role in the structure of human cell membranes. So again, if we, if we take our steroid and add a hydroxyl group, we end up with sterols. So cholesterol, really important component of an, uh, mammalian cell membranes. It's a precursor of hormones, um, such as the sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen. It's an important component of bile salts and of vitamin D that's really important in um, calcium metabolism. So we mammals have cholesterol. We mammals have cholesterol. Um, bacteria cell membranes don't have cholesterol except for one group of bacteria that will steal cholesterol from our cells. We'll be talking about them later in Unit 3. If we're looking at, um, at fungi, uh, fungal cell membranes, um, fungi don't make cholesterol, but they make a, an equivalent called ergosterol. Now this is awesome, you guys, because remember our example of um, a patient being infected with a fungal pathogen, Coccidioides imidis, right? So if the fungal pathogen is growing inside your patient, ideally you'd like to try to find a unique target of the fungal pathogen that the human, your human patient won't have. So one of those unique 
um, fungal targets, um, something the, the fungi have that we don't have is this ergosterol. So um, if we look at that toxic drug, antifungal drug, amphotericin B, the mechanism by which amphotericin B can kill fungi is that it will bind to the ergosterol in the fungal cell membranes and cause the membranes to get leaky. And whenever a cell has a leaky membrane, that cell's going to die. So the hope is, the hope is that the amphotericin B can kill the fungal pathogen before it does really significant damage to your patient cells. So it was wonderful when, um, um, after the discovery of amphotericin B, more work was done, and a much safer group of antifungal drugs was discovered. These are called the azoles. And perhaps some of you maybe have bought over-the-counter antifungal azoles like myconazole, clo I think there's clotrimazole. And what the azoles do is they bind to the enzyme, the fungal enzymes that make ergosterol, and they shut down ergosterol synthesis. So it's a different mechanism, but the result is the same. Without ergosterol, the fungal cell membranes become leaky. And again, leaky membranes, um, the result is the cell's going to die. So these azoles are safe for antifungal drugs, but unfortunately in some really serious um, valley fever infections, the azoles can't kill the coccidioides, and then they have to turn to the more toxic amphotericin B. Um, this, this little bit down here, you guys don't worry about it. This is me just being kind of nerdy, um, because we, we always say, well, bacteria don't make, you know, bacteria don't make cholesterol, bacteria don't make ergosterol, but there, there is a functional equivalent, equivalent that was discovered in this bacteria sterile like hopanoid, but just don't even worry about that one. That was me just being a little bit too nerdy for words. The final lipid we're going to discuss, folks, are the waxes. And I always think of wax like birthday candles, you know, or the honeycomb of bees. And I'm like, why would we study waxes in microbiology? Well, it's pretty fascinating and really important that we understand where we're going to find waxes in the microbial world. So the waxes are, they're alcohols, uh, so like a, um, a carbon backbone with incredibly long fatty acids tails, really, really long hydrocarbon tails. So these waxes are amazingly hydrophobic, so hydrophobic. And the reason we're so worried about waxes in, in microbiology is that there is a special group of bacteria called the acid fast bacteria. And you'll see this abbreviated in your micro readings as AFBs. And AFBs are unique because they make waxes, and these waxes are found in their cell walls. And the wax that, that we'll focus on is called mycolic acid. Again, this incredibly long hydrocarbon tail. So these acid-fast bacteria, there's two important pathogens I'd like you to know, which are acid-fast bacteria that have these waxes in their cell walls. And that's mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes to tuberculosis TB and mycobacterium leprae, which causes Hansen's disease. Now, in the old days, a person infected with mycobacterium leprae, they would be called a, a leper, right? And we don't want to use that term anymore because in saying a person's a leper, you're saying they're no longer human. You're saying they are their disease. So today, um, if you're helping patients that are infected with mycobacterium leprae, and we have we have people in California who are. You tell them and their family they have a bacterial infection and the name of the disease is Hansen's disease. We don't use the term leprosy anymore. We want to avoid that emotional burden of saying, oh, you have leprosy, you're a leper. Okay, so who cares? Who cares that the mycobacterium have these waxy mycolic acids in their cell wall? Well, the consequences are bad news for us. Because most of our antibiotics are water-soluble, they're hydrophilic, it's really challenging to get antibiotics across the waxy cell wall of the mycobacterium. So you have to choose your antibiotics carefully, and unfortunately the patient has to be on those antibiotics for months, sometimes like 18 months. Um, and that's really hard on your patients. Furthermore, it, that waxy hydrophobic layer makes it really hard to stain these mycobacterium. When we start doing gram stains, if we, were, if we had, say, um, a sputum sample from a patient with suspect TB, if we made a smear of the sputum and then gram stain, 
that waxy layer might prevent the gram stain reagents from staining the mycobacterium. And when we look at our slides, we might overlook them, right? It would be a, it's considered a false negative. So we have to have special staining techniques, the, the so-called acid fast staining techniques, which we will be describing um, in lab and lecture. So this is an acid fast. I'm presuming possibly a sputum sample from a person with mycobacterium tuberculosis. And we'll see in the acid fast stain, only the mycobacterium are going to stain red. In all other cells, all other microbes will appear blue. So here's those doggone mycobacterium. These would be little clusters of them here. So they're hard to stain. Um, the waxy layer protects them against antiseptics and disinfectants. So you have to be really careful choosing your antiseptic or disinfectant to make sure it will kill the mycobacterium. Um, if I have TB and I'm coughing mycobacterium um, into my environment, the waxy layer prevents them from drying. So the mycobacterium can remain infectious for long periods of time in the environment. That waxy wall also makes it really hard for cells of our immune system, our phagocytes, to kill the mycobacterium. So we're going to see they're really hard for our phagocytic cells to destroy. Um, and, and we need we need some um, immune help from our uh, adaptive um, specific immune response to help our phagocytic cells kill them. So those doggone acid fast bacteria, they are troublemakers. I think that's it, folks. Right? Oh, this was, um, again, when I was just doing some searching, this was a really great Stanford video introducing pathogenic fun fungi, um, talking about chitin or gosterol. Um, so we will have two labs that focus on fungi, and this would be a great YouTube to take a look at um, in preparation for that lab. Okay, folks, believe it or not, I think that was the final um, part for our lecture unit two, chemistry and biochemistry. Our next unit, we're going to get to see how we're going to use these organic molecules to build our microbes, right? So the next unit is going to be unit three cells, and we'll definitely be focusing on bacteria. Thanks.